We are all purposed, molded by the hands of our Creator. We all have different passions and callings, but we are, in a way, the same. We are all created for connection. We are made for deep, vulnerable, intimate relationships with one another, to sharpen one another, to learn from one another, and to reach the lost with the love of Jesus. This is discipleship. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. You see, discipleship is our common purpose. We are all made for it. You know, it's a beautiful picture to watch um, her making clay. And, you know, I remember when I was in high school, I had the opportunity to, um, to be in a pottery class. And I didn't know much about it, but I just knew it was either that or some other classes I wasn't excited about. And so I jumped in and not really knowing what I was getting into. But, you know, what was really fun is about pottery was that... Um, is that, you know, there really are many stages, right? There's many stages to developing a, a pitcher, a bowl, a plate, uh, any, any kind of pottery piece. And um, what was cool is that you get to take it from beginning to end, you know? There's not a lot of things you can take from beginning to end in just, uh, just a couple of days or maybe in a week. And I got to do that over and over and over. And <clears throat> what I loved is that although there was a process of the shaping and the and the molding and the making of the clay, that there was a reward looming. And when you finally got to that finished product, and you're like, oh. And I remember taking that and would go home. And, you know, when I showed my mom, my mom loved everything I made. None of you would have bought it, but, um, but to her, it's priceless, right? And, and in many ways, in the hands of our maker, if we all are simply... <laughs> Um, uh, lumps of clay that God has formed, and in pottery making, you have to stretch it sometimes, right? Sometimes you have to kind of pull on it. You actually have to cut away pieces that maybe aren't shaping right or are going to mess up the rest of the entire piece. And so whether it's shaping or stretching or cutting, in many ways, as you are on that wheel, in the hands of God, he is making, shaping, cutting, so that he's able to have this finished product that is priceless, right? I mean, that is you, that is me. I don't, I don't know what your year's been like. I don't know where you are currently in life. If you are feeling like you're on the top of the world and feeling amazing, or if you're kind of just making it or in survival mode, but I want you to know that God has created you to be priceless in his eyes. And maybe others haven't seen the value that you are, but he does. Right? My children, I have five kids. My five kids, they are priceless to me. I think they're the best five kids in the world. No offense. I mean, I, I, I think they're amazing. Their potential is like un, unmatched. I mean, I believe they will do great things and that they are the kindest and the most, you know, that some of my kids are just hilarious and other ones are just servant-hearted. And I'm just thinking, man, they really are like the best humans on the planet. I mean, but as a dad, I should think that. I'm not walking around the store thinking, oh, I wish I had that kid. Hey, 
Hey, how about a trade? You want to trade? No, you'd be out of your mind to like trade kids. No, but like, but sometimes we think about that about ourselves, don't we? Hey, um, are you sure you guys want me? I mean, do, you want, do you want someone else? I mean, I don't have that gifting or maybe I'm not smart enough or you don't know my past. I don't, I don't know if I'm good enough to be on this team. But you know what's amazing is that God handcrafted you. He made you. And yes, the world has poked holes. Your sin nature has poked holes. Others have tried to take away or to rip apart or even put cracks in who you are. But he has made you. He has made you. And if wherever the holes are, cracks are, did you know he can restore you? He can reshape. He can remold. So again, I don't know where you're coming from this morning. (laughs) I'm just glad you're here. But I need you to hear from a father's heart that no matter where you've been or what you've done or the mistakes that you have made or the sin or the grief you have caused others or the hurt and the pain, God says you can come to him through Jesus and he can restore all of it. He can make it right. He's not going back in time, but he makes it right now. These next few weeks, we're going to continue our series called Made for It and Made for Discipleship. That's really the heart. We're taking six weeks to talk about discipleship because I know that for many of you, discipleship is a buzzword. It's it's kind of hip and cool in Christian circles. Oh, yeah, dude, I'm a discipleship. You know, it's like, what does that even mean? I don't know, but I'm into it, (laughs) right? I was watching this deal. Let me show you as far as watching this. Ash and I used to watch the Food Network Star years ago when it actually was better. Um, we haven't watched it in several years, but it used to be decent. And so we're watching the Food Network Star, and, you know, you got this panel of, like, judges up there, and, um, and you're supposed to make your food and, like, present to the judges, right? And so they're presenting, and this one guy, he's up there, and he's like, you know, I did, like, a little chipotle aioli, and then I sprinkled those, like, some some like chipotle bits and then we kind of mixed it in it gave a little heat so so you know a little more chipotle flavor he just kept saying chipotle (laughs) like over and over and over and i don't know if you've seen the food network there's this guy bobby flay on the food network he's looking at him like you know so the first question he gets done and he's like i got a question for you what is chipotle and and the guy's like uh it's like uh he just like you know (laughs) didn't know he's talking about and they're like, and where do the, and where's Chipotle come from? And the uses, and it's just, like, we tend to do that in Christianity, don't we? Right? Oh, no, man, like, yeah, like, God spoke this thing, and it was awesome, and really, tell me about that. What, you want me to tell you about what I felt? Yeah, just put it into words. Whoa, I can't do that. Or, hey, man, I'm really into worship. Oh, great, tell me about that. Like, what is that experience, and where do you get that in the Scripture, and why do you worship? And, well, I don't know, dude, I'm just into worship. Get off me. Oh, man, discipleship, it's so cool. And man, my church is all about discipleship. I went to this camp where we're doing discipleship. I did a D now in high school for a weekend. I, I mean, I'm all into discipleship. And everywhere I turn, it's like, okay, so what is that? Share me the testimonies of that. Give me clarity on that. What does Jesus have to say about that? And we're all kind of stuck. So it's okay, you're in a safe place, because we're all pretty much in that same lump. We're like, we want it, but we're not really sure what it is, how to do it. If I went to court and I was, had to give a defense, I'm not sure I would win. I think I might be thrown out as like a fake. I don't know, but I want it, right? So we're going to talk about it for six weeks so that it gives us clarity, understanding, and really our hope and our goal And this Made for It series is that by the end of six weeks, not only do you have a biblical clarity for discipleship that can carry you the rest of your life, you have a deep conviction for why it matters, and you are actually doing it, right? It's that you know it, that you believe in it, and that you're doing it. So in six weeks' time, if you'll journey with us, man, I'm telling you, I think you will get there, and you'll be... Ten years down the road, 
and you've got vision for discipleship, you've got clarity for discipleship, you've got experiences with it, you're doing it, and then one day when you stand before Jesus Christ, our Lord, at the judgment day, the very end, he's going to stand, you're going to stand before him, and he's going to look at your life. He's going to say, what did you do with the life that I gave you? And you're going to say, I made disciples. He's going to say, now that's what I'm talking about. I made disciples because that's what you said to do. That's right. That's what I said to do, and you did it. So I want you guys to know if you want Jesus to be, have a big smile on his face, making disciples is part of that journey. Amen? All right, so here we go. So we're talking about one type of discipleship today, three more types in the next few weeks. So I'm going to help us understand at Antioch, we're going to zero in on kind of four ways to make disciples. Okay, this is going to be the same definition, but we're going to help you understand there's actually four ways we're going to go about doing it. But before we get into that, I want to take us back to Genesis chapter 1. If you've got your Bibles, Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. From the very beginning of creation, God chose to make us. Hence the lump of clay analogy. He chose to make us. Actually says he formed Adam out of dust. And so he chose to make us, and he also chose to have relationship with us since the very beginning of time. But the choice to eat the fruit of the forbidden tree in the Garden of Eden allowed sin to enter the picture into our world, and that is where the severing or the disruption of our relationship, mankind, with God began. Sin essentially being this big, dark, gruesome wall that all of a sudden now put a distance between us and God. And just as Ray was sharing, distance causes, it can cause distrust, right? Distance can be miscommunication, misinterpretation. Distance can be you question your identity, your belonging, your value. When things get distant, you're just not really sure. We need to get close. So God knew that and put a plan in motion to get close again. Right? So the way he went about doing that, the way he went about providing restoration for all mankind, male and female alike, was through his son, Jesus Christ. John chapter 3, verse 16 through 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Oh, sorry. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Do you see? God loves people. He loves people so much, even though we've done a bunch of stuff that's dishonored him, that's gone against his Ten Commandments, that's not shown love to others, that's hurt people, even though we've lied or stolen or committed acts that would grieve his heart, he loves us so much, he's willing to send his only son to make a way of restoration for us. And why did he do that? (laughs) Because he wants relationship with us. He had it in the garden, sin entered the picture, and then he brought it back fully where Jesus came and said, now through Jesus... You can know me as a good and loving and close father. God wants connection. He wants closeness with his creation, right? So when Jesus was asked to pick the greatest commandment that God had given, his answer summarized the whole purpose of our existence. Mark chapter 12. Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. 
The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. There's no other commandment greater than these. You see, we were made for relationship with God. And Jesus affirmed that when he summed up the entirety of the law and the prophets. And if we were to remember just two things, it's to remember that. It's remember that we're made to love God and we're made to love people. So let's talk about the people component, right? The loving your neighbor. Let's go back to the Garden of Eden when God created Adam, the first man to walk the earth. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Every guy should say amen. Amen. If you're not saying it, you just don't know. All right? It's not good for a man to be alone. And I would argue it's not good for a woman to be alone. Yeah, all right. That's what, come on. Just <laughs> See, I don't have to prompt the women. We know. All right? So it's not good for a man to be alone. It's not good for a woman to be alone. And so when you are alone and living isolated and alone, that is not good. I'm dissecting that out of the scriptures, right? It is good when we are together. So soon after, God created the first woman, Eve. And so from the very beginning, before sin even entered the world, it was good that people were together, right? And the first relationship we see is one man with one woman, and that was designed by God. Then we see the relationship form not only between a man and a woman or a husband and a wife, but then we see it form with children. You have a husband and a wife and children. So then you see God's design and intention for the family also because Adam and Eve had sons and then the earth multiplied and so on we went. But beyond marriage and beyond family, there's another that we see emphasized throughout the scriptures, right? We are made for relationship with one another. One another, you can look that word, that, that phrase up in the Bible. It's there countless times to love one another. I just want to read one to you. John 13, 14. I mean, sorry, 13 through thir- or verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So back up here. So far, we've read a few commands from Jesus, right? From Jesus. To love God with everything you got, Right? To love your neighbor as yourself, right? And then it's another way, he says it in John 13, love one another. That's a commandment he's giving to us. He's saying, in the same way I've loved you, you're supposed to love one another. Now, what does he mean by that? A lot of things. But one is, he loves us even knowing all the junk we've done. He loves us in spite of our past. He died for us knowing the evil we had already committed in our thoughts and our actions and our words. He loves us even so. So he's saying it's not just love one another. It's just as I, King Jesus, Son of God, ruler, have loved you, that's what I expect of you. It's a little different. Yeah, that's right. No pressure. It's a little different. We look at it like that. Oh, wait, we're supposed to copy the way Jesus loves. Now, that's a lot. I mean, he is Jesus. I mean, he is the son of God. He's got a leg up on us. But remember, Jesus, when he came to earth, he stepped in human form. And he actually gave himself to the same limitations we have. So what was the X factor? What was the X factor? Jesus could have just been another nice kid growing up in the countryside, right? But no, what was the X factor? You remember when he was baptized in the water by John the Baptist? Talked about that last week a little bit. Then what happened? The Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, and it never left him. He didn't just come for the weekend. Or just when Jesus was being nice. Holy Spirit came 
And then you see the whisking out to the wilderness, coming back to the synagogues, and then the miracles, the preaching, the teaching, and you're like, whoa, what just happened here? See, the X factor is the Spirit of God. Some of us are not believing me right now, and that's okay. I'm asking you to go to the Word. I'm telling you, in my own life, I found it very difficult to love one another when I was not walking in the Spirit. Very challenging. I could play a game. In high school, I was good at playing the game. But I was only nice or loving to people as long as they did it back to me. But as soon as they got nasty, then I just, I just kind of reared back. You know what I'm saying? And it was like, hey, we're only good as long as this works, right? But Jesus says, love as I have loved you. Which means Peter denied him. Others doubted him. Mocked him. Walked out on him. Healed by him. Never said thank you. Whoa, that's a different kind of love, y'all. That's a next level. Uh, l- love isn't like, it's not just, well, I didn't kill anybody today, so I'm loving. No, that's not how it works. That's like the lowest bar ever. Right? Like Jesus said, he said, you've heard it said, thou shalt not murder. But I say unto you, if you have any ill will, any contempt, any anger in your heart towards your brother, that's like murder. Ooh, uh-oh. Wait a second. So what about the social media stuff? Why did we do a social media fast? You ever wonder that? Y'all are like, you can only fast from food. Well, that's what it says in the Bible. They didn't have social media. But if they did, probably would have fasted from it too. <laughs> so why do a social media fast? Here's my question to you. If you're engaged in something in your life, be it social media, TV, sports, Aggie athletics, school, your job, relationships. If there's something in your life you're engaged in that's actually making you a worse person, why do you continue to do it? I mean, it's not that complicated. Right? It's like, what do your parents say? Like, hey, don't hang out with all the drug dealers after school. Like, we don't want you to get into drugs. Right? It's like, you wouldn't want you to be... But for some reason... We're okay with that in society. We just hang around stuff and consume information and content all the time that actually makes us an addict and makes us very dark. But no one's saying anything because it's not drugs. Right? Or it's not, well, I'm not getting drunk. Right? You're just getting drunk on darkness. There's a difference. So church, I'm telling you, if you want to follow Jesus for real, if you're tired of playing the game, Then get in the game and start saying, Jesus, help me with my life to be serious. I I really don't think Jesus is looking for people to play games. He's serious about it. Ask these guys. They've been in the Middle East. It's serious. It's not like I'm kind of following Jesus. It's either you are all in or all out. Because if you're not, that's a murky waters to be in. I think there's a fresh thing God's doing in our nation right now. He's doing it in our city. He's doing it in our church. He's calling disciples to him, but he's trying to say, I, this is what it's going to take. I'm going to ask a lot of you because the reward is great, but nothing, there's not really much in life that doesn't cost you something. You know, there's not many rewards that don't cost you. You don't just walk into things. It, there's a sacrifice element. There's a commitment. There's a devotion, and Jesus is calling us to the same devotion, so we're called to love one another. John 13, 35, he continues on. He says, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So there you go. It's not only did he command us to do it, but then he's saying, hey, the real disciples, you know how you can tell? It's not that badge. It's not the tattoo. It's not the church they go to. It's not the shoes they wear, the organizations they're involved in, not the kind of Bible they have, and like an old beat-up one. I know, some people have thought about just getting a Bible and like roughing it up. Oh, no, I read this all the time, you know? Come on, you, you know that's out there, right? I mean, clothes are like that, right? Aren't they making clothes that they just make your clothes look beat up? It's like, I don't, I don't really get it, but hey, that's okay. I'm, I'm 37, so I'm, you know, I don't care about fashion much anymore. You see, John 13, 35, you see it says, it says about love one another. Now, remember, um, 
the true mark of a disciple, right? We're talking about discipleship here in this series. And remember that this call from Jesus is not for everybody. Let's, let, let's not forget that. What he is saying is that I will, you, people will know you're my true disciples by the way you love one another. Therefore, if you want to be a true disciple, it's, a lot of it hinges on your love and commitment to one another. Because that shows you what's really in your heart towards the Father. So you can't say, I've loved towards God and hate towards my brother. He even says that other places. That doesn't equate. You can't have one without the other. It's both and. Right? And so it's a response to the call from Jesus to be a disciple, to follow him and obey him. You see, people are longing for something real. I think we all are. I was, when I was in college, guys, I was not big on church. You may think, oh, he's a pastor. He probably grew up dreaming about preaching one day. I hated the idea of public speaking. I never wanted to be in ministry, and I didn't have some roadmap to how to get me to lead a church one day. That was the last thing I ever thought about ever, truly. That's another story for another day, but I wanted something real, though, and deep. Don't we? Like, we're humans. Like, we're made for something that's authentic. It's not fake. I mean, E- even, the, even the fake stuff, just after a little while, you're like, come on, man, I just, I'm stuck. And guys, you know, honestly, the last six months, it's, it's almost heightened the reality of how much it's clearly communicated there's virtual, then there's real. And we've been forced to go virtual, but I haven't met anybody that's like, man, I learned way better, like, on my computer screen with my professor talking aimlessly than I do in class getting to interact. I haven't met anyone like that. Maybe you are, and you're the rare bird. Now, listen, I know the introverts in the room, you like, you like loved it for a while. But even you, you're like, oh, man, I'm done with that. I, early on, I, me, I love this. It's like introverts dream, you know. I don't have to get all the social functions. Everyone stop bothering me. But even you, six months later, you're like, okay, I could use some interaction. I mean, doesn't that say something? It's like we're kind of done. It's kind of like we're over it, Right? So God's inviting us back into something deep and authentic and real, something we were made for. And I would argue it's this community that we then find in the context of discipleship. So at Antioch, we have a high value for people living in a community together, meaning that people in the same stage of life are able to meet together and experience the highs and the lows together to carry one another's burdens together. Like that love on another piece means we kind of, we kind of pick each other up. We kind of link arms. You know what I'm saying? It's like, dude, if someone's coming after you, I'm coming after them too. Right? If there's something ailing you, I want to fight there with you. If you're down, let me pick you up. Like that's brother sisterhood. Like that's the kind of stuff that we were made for. You know, listen, um, and, and, and so when, when we talk about same stage of life, then what we're talking about is people you normally interact with on a day-to-day basis, right? So in high school, you're going to be around classmates and teammates a lot, right? In college, you'll be living with, attending, in organizations with, doing projects with, most likely fellow college students, right? Young adults, you're working in jobs in various age groups where the people you mostly will relate to or share life with are those of common interests who have common challenges and common experiences, right? For families, it's kind of where it flips, right? All leading up to that, it's like it's your preference. With families, all of a sudden now it's my kids. It's so now I'm going to be interacting with other parents who my kids play on teams with, who my kids go to school with, right? It wouldn't make sense for me just to have a bunch of parent friends who my kids don't relate to any of their kids or same stage of life. It'd be kind of awkward. That'd be kind of selfish as a parent, right? Like I need to actually reorient and say, okay, We've got to make friends with people that have kids our kids' age so that we're able to foster relationships with them and build relationships with them, right? So just, just remember, the older you get, the more humility you got to have because <laughs> it's just not about you. It just, it just that left a while ago. You know what I'm saying? But that's good. That's the process. That's the maturing process to Jesus. It becomes more and more not about you and more and more about him and them, right? That's the trajectory we are all on. So today, I want to show you something that I think is going to help us provide some understanding and clarity around discipleship at Antioch. And as, as in, in, in regards to how we're going to move forward 
with discipleship. Okay, so earlier I told you that we're going to be going after kind of four ways of discipleship. Before I show you this, this diagram, I want to share with you this definition. You can write this one down if you want. So if someone asks you later today, hey, how would you define discipleship? You can use this definition if you would like. Discipleship is one person helping others become lifelong, obedient followers of Jesus who in turn help others do the same. I'll read it again. Discipleship is one person helping others become lifelong, obedient followers of Jesus who in turn help others do the same. So keep that definition in mind whenever you think about discipleship. So when Bobby Flay asks you about discipleship and not Chipotle, you're like, oh, I got it, man. Right? And you move on to the next round. Okay? So discipleship is one person helping others become lifelong, obedient followers of Jesus who in turn help others do the same. That's discipleship. All right? So we are made for discipleship, and yet the forms and the types of discipleship may vary based off our needs or our season or stage of life. You hear me on that? So we're going to unpack four different types over the next four weeks about discipleship. So I want to show you this diagram real quick. If we got it. I think we got it on the screen maybe. So here's the four types of discipleship, okay? So first, disciple making on the left-hand side. Lived out in missional communities called life groups. So you may heard us talk about life groups before. Before we get into these, and we're going to talk about peer discipleship in just a minute, um, but life groups are missional communities, okay? So if you've been to Antioch a while, if you're brand new, if you're coming from a different church or never had a church, you may have heard of small groups or whatever people will call them. So here's what we are doing to kick off the fall semester. We're doing something new in Antioch we haven't done before this semester. If you are a college student, you're going to be jumping into a life group. Those kick off this week. So if you're new... If you're a freshman, super senior, anywhere in between, we would love to have you check out some life groups. At Antioch, you're welcome to visit different ones. It's okay. Their feelings won't be hurt. You don't have to kind of be stuck in one. If you don't connect well there, want to try a different night or whatever, that's great. So college students, if you're not in a life group, after the service, go out these doors right outside to the porch area. Our college team's going to be there in these green cool shirts. Say, hey, I want to get in a life group. What do I do? And they'll help connect with you, all right? That's for college students. For everybody else, so that's our youth, so our junior high and high school, our young adults, young professionals, and our families, empty nesters, everybody else, all the non-college people, we're doing something new. Starting this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock at this church, we're doing something called Life Group at 1803. If you're wondering where 1803 is, it's where you're sitting right now. We're at 1803 Briarcrest Drive, okay? So we're doing something called Life Group at 1803, so that we can all pull together, and my wife and I, along with a couple others, are going to help facilitate the largest life group you have ever been a part of and may have ever existed on planet Earth. We're trying to set a record, okay? So, no, we're not really trying to do that. What we're trying to do is to model for all of you what life group is, the values of it, how it works, so that then you can reproduce it. And after the end of four weeks, we're going to relaunch back into home. So just think, we're doing life group at our house, and then we're going to launch back into your house at the end of those four weeks into our young adults, our youth, and our family zone life groups. Does that make sense? So it's going to be exciting. So what that means, too, is if you're new to Antioch, not been to a life group ever, this would be the great time to come. You just come in a room like this. We spread out. We're going to connect. We're going to be together. We're going to have small group times, getting in groups of three or four, getting into the Word, praying, encouraging each other. It's going to be a 90-minute deal. It's going to go 6 to 7.30. All right, so if you want to eat dinner beforehand or afterwards, if you're young adults, I'd encourage you to go get a meal afterwards and hang out. If you're families, you're probably headed to bed, okay? So, but everybody else can do that, all right? So it's 6 to 7.30, starting this Wednesday night in this room at this house. And yes, families, we're working on child care. We're going to have child care available for you, all right? And we'll get those details out to you starting tomorrow. So make sure if you're not on the e-news, you need to get on that or else you will be outside of the loop, all right? So sign up to get the communication. So that's what we're doing this Wednesday, Life Group at 1803. And then at the end of the four weeks, we are launching back into homes as we normally do it for Life Group. Sound good? All right, let's go back to the diagram just for a minute. And let's zoom in on the peer discipleship, if we can, if we've got that. So as we talk about peer discipleship, as we talk about these missional communities, again, missional means salt and light. 
right? Like, when we talk about a life group, we're not asking you to go do a mission trip every week to H-E-B, right? I know some of you. You're thinking, I have to go stand on the street corner and preach the gospel louder than Billy Graham? Like, no. You just need to be salt and light wherever you go. So when you're at the grocery store and you see an opportunity to bless somebody, bless them. If, you, if you're at a restaurant and you've got a waiter or waitress, ask them about their day, their name. Maybe take a chance to pray for them before you pray for your meal. you got a buddy at work who's struggling with their marriage. Hey, man, how's your weekend? Oh, it's terrible. Why? Well, oh, can I offer you some thoughts or some advice? You can actually disciple people at work without them knowing about it, right, by just sharing the truth of Jesus, right, and, and, and all that sort of stuff. So missional living just means we're not going to get cliquish or introspective. Okay, so, so if you're into clicks, you're the wrong place. We're not doing clicks. Some of them exist, and we're disrupting all the clicks by doing life group at 1803. Okay, so that's what you're doing. All right, so here we go. We're talking about peer discipleship, all right? Proverbs 27, 17, you guys know this one, as iron sharpens iron. So one person sharpens another. In the Hebrew, that actually says, um, it talks about, uh, as, so as one person sharpens another, it says the countenance of, about the countenance. Right? You know the countenance of a person. Right? You, they don't have to say anything, and you know how their day is going. We're all like that. I, even, if, even if you're a great poker player, some of you are, you're like, you don't know if I'm happy or sad. You know, you can still tell because you can look at their eyes, and in many ways, the eyes are an indication of the heart. So that's why people wear sunglasses. Right? They, don't want, they don't want you to know what's going on. Like, hey, dude, take those off. I'm not going to take them off. Because you're not taking them off. I already know where you're at. You know? But you don't know that, right? It's just, okay? And so... We know the countenance matters, right? So when you're sharpening someone, we're talking about spiritual brothers and sisters, fellow believers who share similar values and beliefs. That's iron sharpening iron, right? We're not talking about wood sharpening iron. That's not going to work. Okay, but when iron sharpens iron, the whole idea there is that two people are able to spur one another on, sharpen each other, encourage each other, call each other out. So that's where we get the idea of peer discipleship. So the format for this may be one-on-one or in a small group context, but for us at Antioch, generally speaking, we see that most, most, mostly taking place through the context of life group, right? So our life groups help facilitate discipleship. So if you're saying, I want to be in discipleship, my first thing is you would say, well, then go to a life group. And then go to your life group leaders and say, hey, I want to be in discipleship. Because discipleship's for people that are hungry. You can go to one of our life groups, that's fine, and not be in discipleship. There's many people that do. And that's fine. It's, there's no judgment there. But discipleship is, hey, if you say yes to that, what you're saying yes to is we're going to get in the Word, and we're going to start being on the obedience train with Jesus. So if you don't want that, don't sign up for that. Because that person's going to say, all right, bro, so here we go, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, let's do it. And you're like, whoa, that's a little meaty for me, right? And that's cool, right? But like... But if, if you're going to be in discipleship, guys, like, you need to be for real about it. Yeah. Don't waste somebody's time. Yeah. Don't play games. If they say 6.30 a.m. at Starbucks and you don't show up, dude, what are you doing? Yeah. Don't blame the alarm or your dog for eating your phone or whatever. Just <laughs> get it done. Pray to God the night before. Wake me up at 6. I don't know. <laughs> do what you got to do, right? Yeah. But peer discipleship, this is a bro to bro, sister to sister, like, hey, we're either going to sharpen each other or not. You can't be the wood and me the metal. Come on, we got to both get there, right? It doesn't work if both parties don't want to be a part of it. It's such a drag. It's like, okay, college units, it's like being in a project. You know what I'm talking about in your class. And you're like the guy who's like ready to get the A, wants to do it well. And there's like a group of four, and you got that one person. You're just like, dude, doesn't do anything. It's going to drag down the whole group. So now you're having to put a lot of extra energy and effort to get him going just because he won't move, right? Let's not be like that. All right, so here we go. Peer discipleship, right? Secondly, what is it for? I'm just going to blaze through this, okay? Accountability, encouragement, and sharpening. Accountability, encouragement, and sharpening. So here you go. Accountability, John 14, 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because he, it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Here's what you know about accountability. It is spirit of God accountability and person accountability. It's not just the person holding you accountable. It's the spirit too. So be careful that you're not, um, that you're not just leaning into one over the other. 
Both matter. Because in pure discipleship, what matters is that you're able to hear from someone else, encourage you and challenge you, and you're able to hear from God as well, the Spirit of God. A lot of people will give me this, hey, well, I know what he said, but I, the Spirit of God over here. And you do that too many times, what you're saying is, I actually don't want any human accountability. I should be left up to my own thoughts and feelings and interpretations. And that's a ditch. You don't want to get into that. Jesus could have chosen to do his whole thing by himself. He chose to have disciples. They were in his world too. They could see, push back, offer ideas. Yes, he's the son of God, but yet he submitted himself to the human relationships because he knew that's what he needed. Does that make sense? Let's not try to be above Jesus in the way we do discipleship. Accountability. Number two, encouragement. First Thessalonians 5.11. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. That's it. Man, part of pure discipleship is you're there to encourage one another. Build them up. It's like build this person up. Believe in them. You're not competing with them. You're believing in them. You're getting behind them, right? Just like in marriage, my wife and I always say, we're on the same team. When we get in arguments or conflict, it's like, hold on, we're on the same team. We say that to every young couple we're doing premarital counseling with, hey, remember this phrase. You're going you're gonna to wish you remember this one. We're on the same team. Because sometimes we forget that. We're just at each other. And it's like, why are we doing that? We've got to believe in each other. Thirdly, sharpening. So we've got accountability, encouragement, and sharpening. This is the purpose of this peer discipleship, sharpening. Um, it's vital that all parties are committed to having the word of God be central. If your discipleship does not include the word, it's not discipleship. It's called hanging out. I like hanging out. That's cool. We can hang out and talk about football. We'll talk about sports, talk about whatever you want to do. That sounds great. Discipleship, it's got to include this. You exclude this, it ain't discipleship. Because this is our foundation. This is our guide. This is the word of God. So we're not new discipleship that doesn't include this, just moving forward. It may be one verse. It may be a chapter. But this has got to be part of discipleship. Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. I still don't even know what that means. I just know it goes deep. (laughs) Joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. It's just, it's going everywhere we can't even necessarily even get to. That's how sharp it is. It goes sharper than any human mind than any manly, womanly, godly wisdom. It just, it, it's way sharper. And it's clear and it's trustworthy. It's meant for sharpening. All right, so I want us to stand and invite the band up here. So we close this morning. Here's where we're going to end this morning. Um, I want to invite y'all into something. You know, we're talking about peer discipleship today and the fact that we're made for relationship with God and made for relationship with each other. And it starts with us making sure that there's that accountability, that sharpening, that encouragement happening amongst our peers, right? And here's my, my admonition to us today is um, for us to want to go deeper rather than wider. I, I really believe that God is inviting us in right now, our church specifically, right now this fall, Um, the words he's given us is to establish family with Antioch, that we need to reestablish or establish the family here. So we're doing things to do that. Life Group 1803 is one of those efforts, right? Like there's some other things we're going to be rolling out and doing as a church that are going to help push us to intermix generationally, right? To intermix racially, to intermix based off our different jobs, locations, to make sure that we're connecting stages of life and people like we feel like God's trying to establish this family so that it looks more like his heart and what's represented in heaven. So we've got to establish the family. But the way to do that, though, is to do what Jesus did, was well, to invest in a few. I'm not asking you to get to know everybody in this whole room. That's impossible. <laughs> um, but I think that God is inviting us to go deeper rather than wider. So what does that look like for us? It looks like you being involved in a life group and just getting a discipleship with just a few. I don't need you to disciple the world, just disciple a few. Jesus discipled 12, which is a lot, by the way. But through those 12, the world absolutely changed. 
We shared last week how he had several different options how to do ministry, but he chose to establish him to be his main thing. For us as a church, what would it look like if we actually went deeper? We said, you know, I don't have to know so many people. I just got to know a few. But invest in them, care for them, carry their burdens, and to make it real and authentic and deep. Amen? So that's what we're going to respond this morning. I just want to pray for us. And just wherever you're at, I just want you to be allowing God in just to your heart right now. Because I think some of us have a little bit of wounding or confusion from the past with discipleship or a friend discipleship or peer discipleship. And I think God wants to heal those places and invite us to take a risk again, to be vulnerable and to go deep. So Jesus, we just thank you this morning. We honor you and we say we just want to be like you. We want to follow the way that you've done things. And we need your help to heal the broken places, the places that are hurting, to mend them in the past and to stand us up again and to say this is right it's right that we go deep it's right that we are real with each other it's right that we get vulnerable that we that we restore and that we have someone sharpening us lord we need it so god i pray any place in us that's hesitant or it just it's got to hurt their lord heal those places And then, Lord, we're asking for an invitation for us to go deeper, not wider, to go deeper, Lord. To go deeper with you, to go deeper with one another, we pray. So, Lord, we just ask right now, come and minister to everyone in the room, we pray in Jesus' name.